like to welcome Robin Heinrich, who is CMA's art, the uh, Artistic Director of Community Arts. Thank you for joining us, Robin. Hi, guys. Happy to see you. Well, thank you for both coming. Um, so just to start us off, the first thing I thought of in kind of uh, the first kind of art practice I think of when I hear this word resourceful is quilt making. Uh, and I'd like to uh, show um, this example that's in our collection. Uh, it's made by a maker named Louisa Joyner from Venice from the late 19th century. And quilts, of course, are these traditionally functional textiles. Um, but they've also been uh, opportunities for artists to really be inventive and create new and increasingly daring patterns with materials that they might have on hand. Um, Joyner made what's called a crazy quilt, which appears to use leftovers and scraps uh, in a thrifty way to create a design. But Nadia, um, we learned a little bit more about this quilt and found out that the artist you know, might not necessarily have been completely thrifty or or maybe that's, maybe I'm overstating that, but could you explain what, what we learned about this crazy quilt? Sure, and I have to thank our deck arts curator, Stephen Harrison, for telling us a little bit more about this particular piece in the collection, which is a crazy quilt. It's um, made by a woman named Louise, Louisa Joyner in 1887 about, which we only know because she signed and dated it. And this was a type of quilt that was really fashionable at the turn of the 20th century, uh, very in vogue. And um, if you look closely at it, you see that she's used pretty fine um, silk pieces and silk thread to join together the different pieces of fabric. And we know that she probably displayed it in her home as, uh, you know, an element that she put on display to make her home seem more cozy. Um, and so, you know, even though we don't know a lot about the maker other than she's from Watertown, Connecticut, we know that she was probably a middle class woman of means who was working in this mode of uh, operations, this quilting um, fashion. But, you know, it maybe not what we associated with the typical kind of quilting that you would put on your bed and use to keep you warm sort of thing. Oh, that's really interesting, right? So it might have been more maybe decorative than necessarily functional, right? Um, now, I just want to turn now to uh, a work, a contemporary work in um, <clears throat> in CMA's collection. And many contemporary artists have recognized this kind of artfulness and innovation of quilts, whether it's maybe for, for its functional reasons, or in this case, more sort of artistic, if you want to use that word. Um, artist Sanford Biggers uh, has made an entire body of work uh, including like textile tapestries and sculptures made from repurposed quilts, some of which have been purchased at secondhand shops and others which he's been uh, which have been donated to him. Um, this is an example from CMA's collection called Cumulo, and it's uh, from 2014. Um, now, Nadia, why does Biggers maybe uh, use an existing quilt and maybe just not make his own? Maybe it's a sim maybe it's an easy question, but or a, a, a simple question. But I think it's really uh, important to think why he. Uh, repurposes them, and why does he find this traditional art form inspirational today, right? Uh, this very sort of uh, tactile, handmade tradition. Yeah, these. that's a great, a great question. And so just to give a bit of context on Biggers, he's a contemporary artist born in 1970, so of a younger generation, born and raised in LA, but based in New York now. And it was from a true source of resourcefulness that he started using quilts as canvases. Uh, he talks about how he was mostly doing commissions, large-scale works. Um, he works in a variety of media, sculptural installations, film, video, uh, and wanted to start working uh, in a mode that wasn't so tied to the funding of large commissioners, and so started looking at qu as quilts um, as canvases. And he was doing a commission for a church in the South and um, says that in his research, he became interested in this alleged use of quilts as signposts on railroad. And so started, to, and whether or not that's true, we don't know. But in any case, he wanted to take the coded nature of the quilts, these found quilts that were made by, you know, people once known and uh, add to it additional layer, layers of meaning and coding. So 
at its essence, it's a background that is visually interesting and abstract and historically loaded, which is very much a part of his contemporary practice. And he adds to it and um, has even gone so far as to consider it a, a belated collaboration with its original makers. Oh wow, that's really that's really fascinating. Um, so so it's it's almost more about what the quilt quilt might symbolize or signify, and we can talk. I think we'll get to talking about that a little bit more uh, further uh, along. Uh, Robin, I'd like to you know turn to you. You're the you know as the artistic director of community arts, you really help run Parade the Circle, um, which is the museum's uh, an annual event here at the museum, uh, which showcases costumes, puppets, dancers, masks, floats, all sorts of amazing creativity. Um, um, made by a range of people, some internationally recognized artists, um, a lot of sort of locals, um, uh, kind of art enthusiasts and makers. And in your role, you've witnessed and helped foster a lot of that creativity that is put on display, if not all of it. Um, what is something, and I think we have a, a, an image uh, actually from Parade right now, which is great that Robin's provided us. What is something that you, um, as a teacher of artists and an artist yourself, um, find interesting in specifically Bigger's work? And, and now that we have a little bit more sense of, of maybe the, the history that he might be referencing, what are some things that you take from it? Well, the, the piece is really beautiful. And... Um, you know, I think it's it's great anytime anybody really uses a material or an object that someone else might have disregarded and giving that object or material a new life by repurposing it and finding new meanings for it. So that's something that I find very interesting in general. There's another example right here from Parade the Circle where we've used some other materials to create puppets. But um, regarding that work in general or specifically and and Quilts in general, I find them very interesting because each element, each piece of fabric really represents an important part of the whole of the quilt. And I kind of see that as a parallel to, to community because every person in community has a voice of their own and plays an important role. And therefore, each person kind of like brings an importance, importance to the um, community as a whole. And here in that work, that really is is kind of you know shown too in that pattern right there. It's like every piece is supporting one another, and that really happens in parade too. When you, when you you know the people get together and and create their costumes or their narratives, they're really supporting one another. And so I find that this work and parade they share a lot of parallels that way. Right. That's really beautiful how you think you interpreted this sort of. Um quilt as sort of uh, the yeah uh, as as sort of representative of of sort of communal making right um has has anyone could you i know we just looked quickly at that sort of maybe that large puppet how have uh, artists communities of artists maybe we should say that right just like been resourceful um at parade what have they what are some things uh, they've done yeah so we use things yeah. yeah that specific um example that we're looking at right here you can see that the, the orange skirt and the hat, that, that is construction fencing that you might have seen alongside the road where they're trying to block off a construction site. And here we're reusing that. And then also the blue texture on the puppet, as well as the black on the other puppet, that's uh, from grocery bags and trash bags that we cut up <laughs> and, into little strips. And sort of like the quilting bees, how, get, how they used to get together. We would have a bunch of people come together and have these fringing parties. <laughs> so that was <laughs> it's kind of cool. And we we've always joked that that's like a modern take on the the quilting tradition that we're sort of moving forward with here. No, completely, and turning it into sculpture, like I know some of Bigger's work. Um, now, just to, uh, I know we have a I think a question in already. If anyone has any questions for um, Nadia or or Robin, whether it's specifically around uh, Sanford Bigger's Cumulo or about Parade the Circle or being resourceful, welcome to share your comments about how you've been resourceful too. That's not a bad thing to do. Uh, share some ideas. Uh, but I just wanted to ask maybe Robin and Nadia one uh, kind of quick question while we're waiting for some additional questions to come in. And that's now that we know more um, about Bigger's practice and this idea of like the meaning of the quilt and whether or not it is true that it was could have been a signaling system of some kind, right? Um, during the Underground Railroad, um, uh, a tool of resistance, a tool of freedom. 
um, which is kind of interesting how that's also like thinking about the quilt and, and being resourceful in another way. Um, is there anything about this composition that you think has now newer meaning or 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 or, or, or works with that that sort of um, fabulated, you know, potentially fabulated, I'll say, uh, use of quilts, right? Um, Robin, is there anything that you, uh, yeah, that that you that you're that you see in a new way? Well, I find it very interesting the use of the paint on top of the the quilt. The paint, in a way, represents for me this very organic material that is, you know, on top of this really structured pattern. And here we, we we're looking at this cloud image right now, and the cloud really, in a way, symbolizes this ever changing form that is emerging out of this never changing structure that is provided by the quilt. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, and I love your analogy, Robin, about how you talk about this range of materials that you bring together in Parade and how they become part of the shared community experience, kind of like this range of different textiles that are bought, brought together on this shared picture plane for the, the um, quilt as canvas. And for Biggers in particular, I think that he he consciously plays with this idea of two and three dimensionality and um, using quilts that have the structure that kind of create a blueprint or almost an architectural kind of um, framework within them in the interlocking grids and, uh, and will use it sometimes in ways where he will pull it off the wall and make it into a three dimensional structure. <laughs> In this case, he uses it as a flat structure, but then overlays the cloud motif, which has this depth and three dimensionality to it. And um, and again, I love this reference to an ever changing organic um, ephemeral uh, struck thing in nature that the cloud that you know changes and morphs and passes. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely a conscientiousness to that tension between. The, the paint on top of the quilted pattern. I think we have a question um, in that is actually about uh, the cloud. Um, it is, are the, uh, let's see, are the cloud elements in the in cumulo fabric, <clears throat> are they sewn on top of the quilt? Are you talking specifically about the the, paint, the the cloud right now, or? Yes, yeah, yeah. There was a question about the cloud specifically. Whether the cloud elements, if they are, I think, made of fabric, are they sewn on top of the quilt, or maybe are they painted on top of the quilt? Um, I believe they're painted on top of the quilt. Right. Like he truly uses it as a canvas surface that he paints on top of. And there's another great question, just to turn to some questions. What are so what are the first things that come to mind when you see this quilt? Whether it's emotions, ideas, or memories. Robin, do you have a thought about that? Well, once I started looking at it and taking in the, the structural elements of the pattern and then like analyzing the cloud, what that could uh, uh, you know signif you know have have an importance in that piece. I, I kind of see it as this like strive or desire of, for freedom of this like breaking out of a, a specific system and maybe being able to to float or to to you know emerge how one might see for themselves. And we have a, a, a really nice question from uh, Niels here. Um, how would you uh, or do you distinguish among making art, uh, doing crafts, and manufacturing goods? each of which can involve resourcefulness? That's a really good question. Nadia, would you mm -hmm. care to, I mean, I feel like both of you can answer that uh, right. from different perspectives, but Nadia, how would you um, approach that question? I think that's a really great question. Um, and it's up for debate, but depending on your perspective, you know, do you want to respect and observe these delineated lines that exist sometimes in the art world between craft, between fine art, between what you put in a gallery setting, you know, what is put on display as, as um, something to be exalted and a cultural icon, and what is, you know, more something of the hand that is considered craft and more of a humble material. And I think that we think about blurring those lines and um, 
rethinking what a maker can be and what their status is. Um, I think the more interesting for me that contemporary art becomes. Um, so truly, I think we can be resourceful in a way that we rethink the structures of these um, labels. Robin, is there anything here to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, so I second what Nadia said. I, I love how the lines are blurring and, and and it's kind of interesting how every artist sort of for themselves is uh, redefining that, that notion of what be, what's becoming art when they're repurposing materials. And I think a lot of times, of, a lot of times I think it has to do with meaning, how people might apply a meaning to something or they, they're really looking at it as a, as a way of, texture or simply a material that they can, you know, fulfill a certain desire within their work. And I, 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 just to, but maybe just to kind of, I also think one thing I think of is, is sort of the economics of all those things, which I think kind of relates to Nadia, what you were talking about, these sort of, um, you know, institutional divides. And that's something actually we can, we'll probably, I think we'll get to thinking a little bit towards the end. Um, but I would like to now add another layer, right? Um, is that, and that Bigger's work also reminds me of um, Robert Rauschenberg, right? And, I, and we have a, a great Rauschenberg, um, a combine that's in CMA's collection. This was a series of works that he made that were these hybrid painting sculptures that combined found images, objects, um, and sometimes, you know, two and three dimensional elements with paint and canvas. So you can think about it, a painting kind of moving out into space. This one sits on the wall. Some of his combines would, you know, extend into space. Uh, this is called Glorious from 1956. And the title comes from the fact that um, in the upper left, uh, the artist has incorporated uh, several photographs of uh, designer and socialite Gloria Vanderbilt. You're seeing them right now, which were published in a newspaper. This is, uh, you know, she it was newsworthy when she got married um, for, I guess, the third time. Um, so, uh, Robin, you know, often resourceful means reusing, um, and it might be reusing the works of others, you know, like Biggers is reusing a quilt that someone else made, uh, Rauschenberg is using images that someone else took, right, whether we know their names or not. As an artist and a teacher, what are the ethics of doing this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there's a big dis discussion that goes around that, and and in Parade the Circle specifically, we try to um, get people to see the notion that they're, what they create is about celebrating themselves or celebrating their cultures and, and not so much about propagandizing their beliefs to other people, but it's really about celebrating. And I think that notion of celebrating is, is kind of can be taken to that when people are studying other artworks or learning from other artworks. Here's a great example of people that have been, were studying artworks um, from our collection and around the world, and really using these artworks to personify, them, honoring them. You know, they, they, you know, they, they glorifying them in a way and make, bringing them to life. Oh, great! I mean, it's wonderful to see like how this kind of inspiration from collection works, and as a way of, as you said, like honoring Nadia. Like, I guess, can we kind of look? How is? Do you feel Biggers is? sort of honoring the quilt and treating it respectfully and, and as opposed to maybe appropriating it, you know, which is a word that has a, a rightfully so like a negative connotation. It means kind of has an exploitative, right? Uh, it means that we're taking advantage of, of, of something. What, what are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really great question and appropriation is kind of a loaded term. Um, and certainly anytime that an artist appropriates from another artist, something unintended can, ha can happen in that translation. Um, when a male artist appropriates from a maker that is probably women or a group of women, I think that translation is always haunted by the specter of patriarchy and oppression, uh, and that's something to be acknowledged. But I feel as if Biggers is self-aware of this acknowledgement. He uses appropriation as an acknowledgement of history. Um, and he takes these cultural icons, things from the African-American community as a black artist, and exalts them and considers himself this 
um, belated collaborator. Uh, and so more, I think the question for me when I look at works like this is what what is the vision? What is the dream on the behalf of the artist? And is it successful? You know, what is the materiality of it and what is it contributing to my understanding of his use of quilts and um, and history and this materiality and um, engaging with this range of abstract visual forms and their effect of layering materials over one another. Um, and so, you know, the, the, while that's a, a really good question and something to keep in mind, um, I think that, yeah, yeah Bigger's I'm not truly interested in denigrating him for his use of the quilt, but really analyzing it on behalf of its effect. Yeah, and like how does the the he make us you know look at the quilt in this sort of new new light? Um, you know, as Robin said earlier, in terms of you know it being sort of a. Uh, you know, maybe not, not, but something that was maybe disregarded in a certain way, right? Whether that is literally disregarded, I need to, you know, someone tossing an object away or institutionally, you know, disregarded. So right. maybe, maybe it's a good time to compare um, the the joiners, right, crazy quilt um, and Bigger's reuse of a, of a, of a, a traditional quilt. And, and yeah, you referenced the fact that these are, this is an art form that is mainly made by women and Bigger's is a, is a male artist. When we look at these together, right, can we arrive at a more complex understanding of, you know, gender making and craft? Um, can we learn more about like what quilts can look like, who made them and for what purposes? Um, Nadia, would you care to sort of, I guess, start us off and then we'll kind of go to Robin? Sure. Yeah. And I and I love seeing them side by side because you get the sense. And I should also mention that um, part of Bigger's early interest in textiles and particularly in mm -hmm. Quilts made in the United States was an interest in an interest in African textiles, and he has um, a cousin John Biggers who, uh, when he was younger, was older and, go and going back and forth to Africa and brought back textiles that he was exposed to as a young age, and he started to see this connection between this kind of transatlantic journey of these. Um, geometric designs that he initially saw in African textiles that were part of this diasporatic um, community of quilters in the United States. And so um, using mining that as another code within them. So the geometric pattern of the, the quilt in Biggers, I think, is another reference to a deeper history. Um, and in the Joiner's Quilt. It's more of a crazy, you know, it's a crazy quilt. It's not necessarily a pre-made pattern. Um, but as I mentioned, from the materials, it was probably not a utilitarian object. It was probably an object of display um, made by a woman, Louisa Joyner, who we don't know much more about than her name because she signed it. She was clearly proud of it and dated it and displayed it in her home. So yeah, these are even though these are two quilts, they come from very different, I think, cultural traditions and milieus and um, and contexts and you know larger, you know, there's a larger story about class difference and even though they were probably women makers, both of them. Robin, do you have anything to to expand upon or anything? Yeah. To Fine. It's yeah. I find the crazy quilt uh, so interesting that way, and what you just said, Nadia, kind of you know solidifies that. It's it's you know, on your first look at it, it's like oh, it's just a bunch of scraps of fabric that are sewn together. But then you look a little closer, and it's like wow, these are beautiful pieces of <laughs> fabric. <laughs> wow, they're sewn together with beautiful silk thread. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of this um, surprising effect that this work has, you know. Um, and I'm just going to uh, ask our audience if you have any questions about Sanford Biggers, the Crazy Quilt, Robert Rauschenberg, whatever it might be, or about Pray the Circle. Feel free to, um, you know, pop some question in, questions in and we'll get to them. Um, uh, we actually have one about the Crazy Quilt, which I, I, I don't, I, we might be able to answer, but maybe we won't. And that's okay, right? Um, it's from an anonymous person. Did the artist um, title it Crazy Quilt? And why is it called Crazy Quilt? Um, do do uh, Nadi, do you feel, or could you answer that? Or Robin, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
From my understanding, crazy quilts were kind of a trend mm-hmm. after the 1880s. Uh, and they were inspired by a few different things, but they were something that, um, um, you know, anonymous makers were, it was like a format that they were engaging in. Uh, so I don't, I, was, think, I don't think there were patterns to it. Yeah, yeah I, I kind know. of interpreted it to, for the randomness of, of the pattern. And it was a, it was a name given. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to think about genre. It was, it was a a kind of a known quantity as, you know, as, as a type in some ways. Right. Um, While we're waiting for some questions to come through, maybe both of you, maybe Robin first and then Nadia, you know, how have you been resourceful either personally or professionally, if you don't mind sharing um, (laughs) these days, you know, what are things that you found yourself doing? Well, professionally, I've been um, really going on the, the Cleveland Museum of Arts website and studying the artworks that we have within our collection that normally are not on view or haven't been on view in a long time. And now that we can go physically to the building, it's, it's, I think it's a great resource to have. And, you know, every Clevelander should, should sometime come to the museum once it opens again, but also take advantage of of these great resources that we have online. There's, you know, the open access really uh, created a beautiful platform for people to explore art a little bit deeper. And then on a personal level, I've been kind of, you know, resourceful in the kitchen. I've been figuring out how to make my own bread. And you know, we have a little bit of a garden and we've, I started doing some vegetable gardening with the family. So this is, that's been really a beautiful way of finding some new resources here. Nadia? Yeah, I, the same, I'm, you know, being stuck at home and um, I've had to be resourceful about how I have engaged with contemporary artists um, and have started to do it virtually, doing virtual studio visits. And it's been, it's been really fun, you know, something that I would normally have done in person um, and and have been surprised to find that the conversations are just as rich when they take place over um, a screen. Uh, and then in my personal life, you know, I have two two toddlers, and you know, we're trying not to go out unnecessarily. So in the absence of crafting materials, we've just taken to the recycling bins and have made all sorts of constructions out of recycled materials, <laughs> robots and, you know, other different <laughs> costumes and um, all sorts of glued amalgamations. Um, so we're, we're doing what we can. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is wonderful. Um, we have um, one um, maybe uh, final question, if that's okay. Uh, I'm not sure if we can get to it, but I would like to. Um, do you see an Escher influence in Sanford Bigger's Cumulo? So we could get a look at that. Um, yeah, whoever, uh, maybe Robin first and then Nadia. There's like an MC Escher? Like, MC, I believe, yeah, we're talking about MC um, Escher, the, the well, Dutch I mean, artist. I think... The, the pattern, I mean, yeah, I can definitely like, see how that could relate uh, or like Asher's use of a lot of patterns in his work. I think they could be drawn some parallels here and maybe also how that cube is sort of floating on top of the other pattern and emerging out of that. So I can I can see how, how the, the works by these artists can be put side by side and explored in the context of being paralleled. Do you have anything you'd like to um, add about that or? Yeah, I agree. I think if you put them side by side, you know, I don't know if this quilt, we don't know the dates of the quilt uh, Mm -hmm. in this this particular quilt. So maybe it was before Escher, maybe it was the same time as Escher. Um, But certainly the creation of this illusion of depth with a geometric pattern is absolutely related. So um, I think we're I think we're at our time. So um, I want to thank uh, you, Nadia, and you, Robin. Thank you so much for joining us on our second venture. Thank you, uh, Andrew. <laughs> thank you. 
Oh, nothing. Um, I want to thank um, <laughs> all of you for joining out there. Uh, Desktop Dialogues is going to happen every Wednesday at noon. Next week, we're going to have educator and scholar Kijo Lee and curator Stephen Harrison. Uh, together, we'll be discussing works of art that reflect on the comforts of the home. Um, and if you'd like to watch this again or share with a friend who happened to miss out, just check it out on CMA's YouTube channel or on the website. It'll be up there very soon. Um, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks again for joining us. Stay safe and healthy. It was great seeing you guys. Bye. Good seeing you.